let's talk about skin punctures now and obtaining capillary blood. Capillary blood is obtained either from the tip of a finger or on a baby or a newborn, the keel. If it's the tip of a finger, the most likely choice that you would have is the fourth finger of the non-dominant hand, usually the ring finger. But once again, in order to use this fourth finger of the non-dominant hand, you are going to inspect the area. You're going to observe it for burns, for trauma, for any type of discoloration, and you are going to touch the area. And the reason that I want you to touch the area a little bit and hold the patient's hand is to feel it if it's excessively cold. Because if you know if a person comes in on a January morning and it's very, very cold outside, and you try to do a skin puncture and obtain some capillary blood, that isn't really gonna happen, okay? You need to have the patient wash their hands in some warm water. Remember, heat dilates the vasculature, especially the capillaries. So you always want to pre-warm an area, either by a warm towel or an infant heel warmer, or having the patient wash their hands in some warm water. I have kind of listed for you on the board a little bit of a order that I want you to follow when you're doing capillary skin punctures. And the first thing that I would like you to have the patient doing after properly identifying the patient is to have them dangle their hand just down at their side, just gently. This causes two things. It causes blood to flow to that extremity. It causes capillaries to dilate, and it causes capillaries to congest with the blood. Number two, have them bring their hand up and wipe the finger that you're going to choose. And the finger, once again, is the fourth finger of the non-dominant hand, but really, in reality, you can use any of these two middle fingers. Now, predominantly, we try to stay away from the little finger, we try to stay away from the index finger, and we try to stay away from the thumb. The little finger is really proximal to bone. And so in order to puncture it, we could maybe have the possibility of hitting bone. The index finger and the thumb are really kind of calloused. And so in order to obtain blood from those areas is a little bit difficult at times. It doesn't mean that your facility wouldn't allow that. It just means that predominantly, if you can kind of stick with these two middle fingers, and ideally the fourth finger of the non-dominant hand, that's your best choice. So have them dangle their hand, bring it up, and wipe the area. And here, as opposed to a venipuncture, you do not have to start at the center of the finger with concentric circles. You can just kind of wipe back and forth, okay, and clean the area. And once it is wiped with the appropriate solution, as in 70% isopropyl alcohol, then I have the patient kind of wave in order to dry the alcohol. Remember that wet alcohol will chemolyze blood cells, red blood cells. Remember, hemolysis means the red blood cell will burst. So you do not want hemolysis going on with the blood sample. So as soon as the area is prepped and wiped, have them wave to make sure that area is dry prior to puncture. The next thing you want to do is pick up your lancet. And I'm holding a lancet from a particular company and realize one thing about lancets. Lancets for babies or lancets for adults are all in different colors. They're all in different sizes. They're all in different configurations. So it depends on the company that's producing it. This one, in order to load it, you have to press in like this. What this does is it engages a spring on the inside. The next thing you want to do is to hold it between your uh, thumb and your middle finger, just like this, and I put my index at the top, and I take this little cap down here, which is covering an interior needle, and I twist the cap, and I pull at the same time. This cap will come off of the needle that's inside. What you don't want to do is hit this trigger because once this trigger is hit, the needle will come out and it will retract back up and you're not ready to do that yet. 
So when I say lancet, you just simply uncap it to get it ready. The next thing you want to do is melt the area. And I'm just going to put my lancet down here. We're going to show you this in, in steps. But when I say milk, you want to kind of start down here with the other hand at the base of the finger, and you want to pull up towards the tip. The thing that you want to try to avoid is going back over your prep site, your alcohol site. So you want to kind of pull the blood up and milk it up towards the distal tip of the finger. And then you want to hold. You want to hold the blood in that area. Then the last thing that I have down here is just simply the word go. And go means once you hold, you want to position your lancet. And when you position a lancet over a fingertip for an adult, you do not want to position it directly up and down. You do not want to position it directly to the side. You want to position it almost in a 45 degree angle, almost halfway between the top and the side of the finger. And then with firm pressure, you want to slide your thumb up, press the trigger, and engage the needle. The needle will come out, it will stick through the patient's skin, and it will retract. As soon as that happens, you want to place your lancet down, you want to squeeze the finger so a little drop of capillary blood appears on the surface. I always think it's essential, and so does some of the standards out there, that you wipe away the first drop of blood. This is due to the fact that the first drop of blood is saturated with a lot of tissue fluid. Therefore, it is a diluted sample. You do not want to use a diluted sample, so you want to wipe away that first drop and then milk and use subsequent drops. The subsequent drops of blood can be placed on a reagent strip. They can be placed in a capillary tube. They can be placed in a small little tube in order for collection. Or they can be placed on a slide for a blood smear. So the disposition of the blood really depends upon the test that you're going to order. But you want to wipe away the first drop and you want to get subsequent drops of blood. For a baby or a newborn, we're not going to use the finger. We're going to use the heel. And I have a little phrase up here called medial lateral plantar heel. In fact, my students memorize the first letter of each of these words, and we have a little sentence. Make little people happy. And basically what we do is we take the bottom part of the foot, and we draw an imaginary line right in the center of the great toe, all the way to the back of the heel on the bottom of the foot. We draw an imaginary line between the fourth and the fifth toes, once again, all the way to the back of the heel on the bottom. And we use these areas right here. We do not use the arch of the foot. We do not use the posterior curvature of the heel. We stay in these areas. And something very interesting about this is the following. Always rotate sites. Whether you're doing vena punctures or skin punctures, do not keep sticking the area over and over again, the same area. Rotate your sites so that you lessen trauma to the area and you lessen the possibility of pathogenic entry into the area. The puncture on the bottom of the heel, right here, in, in this area here or this area here, is going to liberate capillary blood. But one essential difference between an adult and a newborn is that the needle that goes in the heel is a sufficient less length than the needle, needle that goes in the adult. And the reason for that is the capillary bed in a newborn is only about 1.6 millimeters beneath the surface of the skin. If we would use, for instance, an adult lancet, on the heel of an infant, we could hit bone and we could cause nerve problems and so forth. And so anytime we do a newborn or we do a baby, we use a different lancet with a shorter needle, 
probably 1.6 millimeters or less. And those lancets are all made by different manufacturers. One of the lancets we use on an infant heel is called Tenderfoot. Another is called a quick heel lancet. But once again, these lancets have a very short needle, not to sew, puncture bone or nerve and cause further damage. Right now, we're gonna demonstrate a skin puncture. And again, Veronica and Al are kind of helping us and assisting us today. The first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna have Veronica dangle one of her hands down at her side. Once again, this is gonna cause a little capillary congestion, bring blood to the distal tip of her finger, and she's gonna bring her hand up. Al is now going to examine either the middle finger or the fourth finger of the non-dominant hand and look for an area that's not scarred or edematous or traumatized in any way. Once Al has established which finger he's gonna use, he's gonna pick up his 70% isopropyl alcohol, read the label, he's going to open it up and he's going to prep the area. Again, we do not need to go in concentric circles here on the distal tip of the finger. We just need to clean it appropriately. Once the finger is prepped, he's going to have the patient wave their hand back and forth in order to dry the area adequately. He's now going to pick up his lancet and he's going to hold it and push in the little yellow cap. That will engage the spring on the inside that's in back of the needle. He's now going to twist the cap and pull it off. He's now going to hold the lancet between his middle finger and his thumb. He's now going to start at the base of the finger and pull up one time between his thumb and his index finger. He's rolling the rest of his fingers in. He's now going to position the lancet almost at a 45 again on the finger, halfway between the top and the side. He's now going to reach up and engage the needle. And as he engages it, the needle goes into the finger and it retracts back up. He's now gonna squeeze a little bit and get his first drop of blood. Remember that the first drop is liberated with tissue fluid. He's gonna wipe away that first drop, putting his two by twos down. He's now gonna support the finger with one hand, start at the base with the other and pull up to where he gets a big drop. Just a little bit more than that. Okay, once he gets a big drop of blood, this big drop can be put on a reagent strip. It can be put in a capillary glass tube. It can be put on a slide. So there's many dispositions of this capillary blood. Once the test is over, he's gonna pick up the two by twos again, kind of fold it into quarters, hand it to the patient. The patient is gonna use their thumb directly over the top of their finger and apply pressure. Once sufficient pressure has been applied for three to five minutes, Al's gonna make sure that the bleeding is controlled by lifting up on the corner of the two by twos. Once the bleeding is controlled and stasis is achieved, he's going to put the two by twos down. He's now gonna pick up a simple Band-Aid and put it over the end of the finger. Again, even though this is a skin puncture, it is so essential that you check with your patient and you make sure they're okay that you observe them for signs of pallor, cyanosis, tachypnea, rapid breathing, tachycardia, rapid pulse, diaphoresis, sweating. If it looks like they're about to faint, have, that is a syncopal episode, have them put their head down, take some slow deep breaths and call for help. Once any procedure is over, either a skin puncture or a vena puncture, it is an essential, important part of this procedure that you just do not grab this whole setup and squeeze it together and take it over the, tr the trash. The reason being is because you could easily stick yourself with a needle. So what I do, especially with these procedures, is I have Al pick up the alcohol pad and he's gonna pick it up, he's gonna fold it into quarters. Okay, almost like a stick, and he's gonna hold it at one end. 
just like this, and hold it vertical. And he's holding it vertical, and now he's going to separate his trash from his sharps. This is really important in any type of procedure so that you don't get stuck. Because you could have several needles in several lancets down here with a needle maybe exposed, even though they're supposed to retract. Once the trash is separated from the sharps, he is going to put his trash down. He is going to pick up a sharp, okay, and he is going to bring it over to the sharps box. Notice this biohazard rigid container. He is going to hold the sharp at one end. He is going to take it and without putting his fingers in the hole, close to the hole, a little closer, he's going to drop it in. Never put your fingers down into a sharps box hole. Notice Al is now disposing of his trash by holding it over the trash can and letting it drop. He's going to let his trash drop into the trash. Never is he going to take his hand and put it down inside of a garbage pail because somebody could have taken a needle inadvertently, just left it in the garbage, and you're going to get stuck. So do not be a trash compactor. Just drop the trash over the can and let it go. He is now going to reach up to one area of the glove, very, not the very top, but right here where he's reaching, almost a little bit beneath the very corner of the glove. He is going to pull the glove down all the way off his hand. He's going to turn his hand over and wad it up. He's going to come under the glove with his other finger and now pull it over the top of that first glove that's wadded up. And he's going to dispose of his gloves. He is now going to walk over to the sink. He is going to use, if this isn't an automatic towel dispenser, hopefully it is, but if it isn't, he's going to use the corner of his arm to engage a paper towel. He's going to use the corner of his arm again to get a little bit more paper towel hanging down. He's now going to take the paper towel and reach over to the faucet and turn it on. He's now going to take the paper towel and put a little soap on his hand. But he's not going to touch the knob of the faucet or the knob on the soap dispenser. He's going to throw the paper towel away. He's now going to hold his hands lower than his elbows. And he's going to wash for approximately two minutes. Okay, notice he gets the side of his hands, he gets his fingers, gets the nails. Okay, this is really important. Hand washing is one of the most significant effects of lowering the transmission of pathogenic organisms in the hospital. After a two minute wash, Al is going to rinse his hands. He's going to then get rid of any excess water. He's going to reach up to the towels that have been exposed, pull them off and dry his hands. He's now going to get rid of this paper towel. He's going to engage another paper towel coming down. And he is now going to turn off the fountain. Again, never touching the faucet handle and never touching the soap dispenser with his hands. Remember, hand washing is not only important after a procedure, but it's important before a procedure. The same techniques that Al has demonstrated is going to go on before every type of procedure that you do. And it is going to go on after the procedure. Remember to disinfect your areas prior to any procedures and after every procedure. We would like to thank you for your time in watching this video. We would like to encourage you to read your policy and procedure manual, to follow CLSI standards and to remain vigilant in your techniques. Thank you.